Okay, we're going to introduce uh, Dr. James Landmeyer. He's a research hydrologist with the U.S. Geological Survey. I'm going to let him introduce himself, but I did want to add one little component here, personal one. Jim may not remember, but 15 years ago, I was with the Alabama Forestry Commission in Montgomery, and the city uh, became aware of a chlorine solvent plume uh, in downtown Montgomery that had contaminated some ground, uh, some public wells and was migrating towards the Alabama River. And it was Dr. Landmeyer that did some testing and studying of the street trees in downtown Montgomery, uh, but through analysis was able to tell them the extent of that plume and where they should focus their attention, which resulted in a tree planting project to try to intercept that migration uh, to Alabama River and I was involved in that but Jim I don't you know I, I, I just wanted to, really that was for you more than anybody to know that I have a little history with you and and it was an inspiration to me to learn more about phytoremediation it makes me real pleased that we got you here today to, to help expand our knowledge and uh, I'm just going to turn it over to you at this time. Okay great um, let me go ahead and share the screen And hopefully you can see the slide, the first slide. Yes, yeah, we okay. can see it. And, you know, I apologize right up front that it's you're gonna have to think like you're listening to a podcast on the radio because for whatever reason, I can't get my video to show up. And um, unfortunately, I don't look as young as I did in that picture that Neil just showed. Um, so maybe that's a good thing, but, and the other thing too is, is I, I want to let Neil know that in fact, um, the very thing he just mentioned, and this is without either you or myself, uh, talking about it ahead of time, that's really what I'm going to use as an example, um, of, you know, when I thought about how could I put my research into focus and context for you know people whose living is looking at urban forest the best thing to do is to use my example that's near and dear to, to me is uh the urban forest at montgomery so thanks for the um uh the touch in on on essentially what what i'm going to explain to you guys today is how urban trees that we walk by every day and, and maybe because of familiarity, we, we, we don't realize or we need to realize the entirety of what they can do. So indeed, I went back and have updated the work that we did that Neil mentioned uh, at the beginning. So let's just jump into it. All right, so the first thing I also wanna to mention to you is, you know, a lot of times people think, you know, the USGS, they just do maps, right? Um, you know, what's this guy doing talking to us about trees and, you know, urban trees to begin with? Uh, so I'm going to just give you a little bit of an overview on what the USGS is and why we can deal with things like trees and why we can work at contaminated sites. I'm going to use that example from Montgomery that Neil mentioned to talk about urban trees and how they relate to subsurface contamination. It may be contamination that's known. It may be um, where the trees can help s figure out where the contamination is, or it may be that you may use the trees and discover there's contamination. You might core a tree one day and see a different color in one of the rings, and then you start the investigative process backwards in time. Uh, but the main thing I want to let you guys know is that, that, you know, the tools that you already have, like increment augers, calipers, things that you already have in your truck, that's really all we can, you know, we, we begin our investigations with is things that you're already familiar with. Now, I am going to make you think a little bit outside of your experience, perhaps, and we're going to bring in some other analytical techniques, but they're all based on collecting good increment cores. So the whole thing at the end of this, you know, 35, 40 minute talk. It's probably going to maybe be a little bit longer with questions at the end, but is, you know, when you pass your trees in your urban settings, I want you to perhaps think about them a little bit differently. All right, so the USGS um, is part of the executive. 
I'm using my mouse, so hopefully you can see that um, the executive department um, that you know these three branches were created through our constitution in 1789, and that's important because of that executive branch back then. Most of the departments under the executive branch dealt with foreign affairs. You know, the country was new, was trying to to establish its credibility. So the idea of looking internally really didn't. Um, you know, come along for quite some time thereafter when the Department of Interior was established in 1849. Basically, it's the Department of everything else that's not, you know, Treasury or War. You know, now it's the Department of Defense. But it was essentially the Department of everything else. Okay. And the USGS is a Bureau of the Department of Interior. And it was established in 1879. This is uh, John Wesley Powell. He's the second director of the USGS. Um, you know, some notoriety with his explorations down the Colorado River and losing an arm in the Civil War, et cetera. But it's essentially, and this is the more important thing, it's a science arm and what's near and dear to being an employee of the USGS is we're not regulatory. You know, we don't necessarily have a target on our back because we're not imposing fines and we're not creating regulations. We don't, you know, own any land. Uh, part of that means that you know in in some cases as scientists we don't have congressionally authorized funding so we have to go out much like people you know in our audience that may be associated with the university or once were where you have to um you know you live off of grant funding you live off of soft funding so that's partly why you'll see us here talking about a case study where we're, we're working with the epa all right so now we're done with that this is one of my favorite trees. I first saw it when my first daughter was born in Columbia, South Carolina. I was looking out of her room, and this, at the time, was a you know half the size of this. Um, but I've watched this tree over the years. I'm currently in, in Tampa, Florida, but we were in Columbia, South Carolina from 1989 to 2016. So I watched this tree grow, and it always amazed me. I mean, it's completely surrounded by asphalt. And I know you've seen this before, perhaps you've wondered, you know, but to me, when I see an urban tree, it's like this is the, the, the poster child for an urban tree. And the only way this tree is surviving, because there's, there's not root, there's, you know, there's no artificial irrigation, you don't see runoff sloping to this tree, is that the plant has to be interacting, obviously with the subsurface, but more to the point with the water table, okay? And, to take that into sort of schematic form, this is things that you guys know already, is that, you know, trees, you know, provide shade and visual aesthetics, but they also are these, these uh, factories, much, you know, chemical factories that do all these interesting things that, you know, most, most laymen know about photosynthesis, you know, et cetera. What I want us to think about more so is how, that same tree with its wonderful chemical processes can also do things with what we call phyto mechanisms or phytoremediation mechanisms. And that means you can have bacteria and mycorrhizae in the root zone from the soil surface down through the capillary fringe to the water table where any sort of contaminants or threats to the plant, you're getting rhizospheric degradation. You're getting sequestration into the root mass where perhaps there's no translocation into the, the sap flow and transpiration stream. Some plants can actually accumulate things like, you know, inorganics and metals. So they take them up out of the soil, but they do concentrate them in, in their tissue. And you can also have things, as I'll, as I'll show later, specific examples of is where nasty contaminants in the soil zone, either as dissolved phase or, or as gases, can be taken up by the plant through the transpiration stream and be actually degraded in the plant before they even leave. And some are just simply transpired out um, wholesale. So there's really no, um, there's no loss of contaminant. It's just simply a, a phase transfer from the soil to the air, which in some cases is much better because in the soil, you know, you have low R oxygen, you don't have UV radiation, and the half-lives of many contaminants are, you know, years up here in the sunlight and oxygen you can have a half-life shortened greatly. 
And again, Neil, thank you for the, the lead off. This is going to be a case study to try to show you the usefulness of our urban trees to help figure out contamination, contamination and perhaps uh, do some remediation. This is um, the case study that we worked with for the uh, with the EPA. It was a former national priority or uh, pollutant list site. Uh, it was never a super fun site. In fact, it, it has been delisted. So it no, no longer is the EPA transferred the authority back to the city and the state. But the most important thing, regardless of the politics, et cetera, is, you know, here's a shot of me standing in the middle of the road, looking up towards the Capitol. And it's lined with these beautiful trees, ginkgos, live oaks, um, uh, crepe myrtles, et cetera, magnolias. In every block, has these beautiful trees. In fact, all around the city, you see signs saying that indeed uh, this this is a tree city. I'm going to show you um, this capital again. And the other thing to notice is there's a, quite a bit of grade. So when it comes to you know the way water flows downhill, particularly groundwater, uh, the relief of this area it was really important in determining where groundwater uh, was flowing and how that related to where you know if you sampled a tree here versus uphill. And one thing I want to, to, to stress up first is that, you know, please sit back like, again, like you're listening to the radio and don't worry about taking notes, et cetera, because all of this is contained in this um, report we did for the EPA. And you can just, you know, go to this link or go to the USGS Publications Warehouse, you know, through uh, any of your web browsers and just type in my last name and this this should pop up. So most of, you know, most of what you're going to see uh, is contained in this report. So you can read this at your leisure and it's free. All right, so a little bit of um, context here. That capital that I showed you, here's the capital rotunda and I was standing, um, no, excuse me, here's, here's the capital right here. And I was standing to take that picture I showed you down here, looking this way up the hill. So this area here is higher topography and everything flows downhill. Here's a creek and then here's the Alabama River. And when we first were brought on board by the EPA, essentially this is what they knew. Again, this is the former capital city plume. It's no longer a super fun site, but essentially this yellow hatched area defined about a 55 block zone where below ground there was detected some sort of a, a chlorinated solvent or other contaminants. Uh, now this is not the exact plume, that's why it's hatchered, but this is sort of you know where the zone of concern was. And a lot of this was you know known and delineated by concentrations of things like TCE and PCE and groundwater wells. And I'll show you a picture of where those wells uh, were. So the EPA came to us and said they, they really didn't know about a source of contamination. And it's a common problem at many sites that are, you know, decades old. And it was difficult because in terms of how the federal government manages things, that, that was meaning that taxpayer money was being spent. Okay, so there was, which is what the Superfund program was designed to do. But uh, essentially, if you don't know where it's coming from, you don't know how it got there. So there's really no way to, for the EPA to get cost recovery. Again, USGS, we don't deal with that. We're just providing the science. All right, so as I said, <clears throat> Here is what we decided to approach answering the EPA's question. Um, and they had that question back in 1993, and basically they still had the same thing in, uh, when they came to us in early 2008. So the capital is up here. We've gotten rid of all the, um, the, the live satellite view type image and just reduced it to the, the very nice blocks and essentially instead of a yellow plume we see the red plume outline here groundwater flowing from that high area down towards the creek and alabama river and what we decided to do is you know you can see these different numbers here this basically means we decided to do a block by block grid survey i mean we 
if we plan to do this out in the field, this would be the same way that we wanted to do a sort of a very, uh, you know, uh, objective approach to look at something in the subsurface. We would have set up a uniform grid. Well, guess what? The city blocks had already been set up that way. So that was a, a really good thing. And what we wanted to do is go block by block, working from the local groundwater discharge areas, which are these two surface water features, and just simply go up through these blocks and collect as many tree cores as we could. Now, in some cases, we were, you know, we had planned to sample, you know, trees in a block where there was also monitor wells. Okay, so we were able to compare technically or theoretically tree core concentrations with the same kind of compound that was measured in a monitoring well. And in other cases, we figured, well, we had to go out here because here there is no monitor well. Um, so that would be providing new information. And you can even see how the wells are not um, distributed in a uniform manner because at the time that this investigation was begun, this was the presumed source. So a lot of wells tend to be put in where sources are thought, and then they start to move downhill. This is a very common uh, process. And also conversely, to slightly move in the opposite uphill direction. Keep in mind, groundwater is flowing downhill. Now that's a natural gradient. Another issue was the city's water wells were also pulling from the same aquifer and had a forced gradient. So it sort of accelerated groundwater flow. So the basic concept, you know, is to go up to your, we know trees are interacting with groundwater. We know that trees are interacting with a capillary fringe. If you have, in this case, a landfill that's bleeding sol solute into the aquifer, if the trees are taking up water and gases, we might be able to see some of what's in, um, in the groundwater in the tree. So if you took a tree tissue sample here versus the tree tissue sample here, because this groundwater is contaminated, we might see a hit here and not in here. All right, so we get both dissolved phase and gaseous phase. In fact, that's what we did. Again, this is something that you guys and you all have used and probably have in your truck are these increment um, augers. And here, big tree growing in essentially a huge pot and I know because we don't see any raising of the sidewalk here, this is probably planted in a culvert, vertical culvert, to con constrain the lateral migration of roots. I know that's something that I've read about, at least that foresters sometimes have to do to, to reduce liability, et cetera, uh, from people tripping on, you know, heaved, heaved sidewalk slabs. But in, in terms of what we needed it for, it actually was a good thing because it forced the tree roots to grow vertically downward. And in some parts of the water, the, the site down near the creek, the water table was, you know, 10, 15 feet below land surface, but up near the capital, it was more like 30 feet. So it really helped. So we went through block by block. And this is the key point. Within one week, we sampled more than 70 trees across 55 city blocks. And we also sampled down near the Alabama River and um, the One Creek. And we did all this work without basically raising too many eyebrows. We didn't have noisy drill rigs. Uh, we didn't make a, you know, a big fuss. We simply walked around and collected tree cores. And we did it during August and it was the hottest, you know, month. It was not the easiest sampling, but we had to do it when transpiration rates were the highest. And essentially, rather than taking the tree core and, and doing, you know, counting rings for tree growth and looking for fungus, what we did is we put each tree core into a 40 mil glass vial. And here you can kind of see this cloudiness on the inside. That's trapped water vapor. But the thing is, is that water vapor is actually, you know, humidity from the tree and the tree if it's taking up water and has that moisture content it also could have contamination and that's what we are looking for the way we did that and this is sort of the new part that you might not be familiar with is 
we've got our tree core, we've got whatever is being volatilized as the tree core is now removed. In fact, you can actually heat these in a water bath. You can put them in a microwave if you're trying to get whatever is in the tree core out quicker. But you get it into the headspace and then you take a syringe sample of the headspace and then you basically treat it like a gas sample. So you either inject it in a portable GC. In fact, we set up one, one fellow did it in a hotel room. We were just, we would be collecting cores in a block. Then we had somebody shuttle the tree cores up to the hotel room. And then all the analyses were being done there. And then you get something like this, you know, you fire up the GC, you get these peaks, and then you get uh, these known peaks, like here we got TCE, this is just an example. And then you can quantify um, how much is in each particular tree core. Uh, something we did not use, but I wanna make sure if you're thinking about doing these types of investigations, you don't need the GC. You can buy something called a color tech analyzer and you can, instead of just getting soil gas or getting, you know, room, you know, vapor intrusion type samples, you basically take your tree core vial, use your syringe, and rather than a GC sucking the air out, you use a hand pump. And so here's our tree core. This is from a different site. Like I said, we do not use this um, for that particular study. And then you just look at a color change, and the color change is recorded based on, and it's calibrated um, based on the, these markings. So you could actually still get some level of whether it's not, you know, not is it present or absent, but how much might be there. And it's very rapid. All these methods, if you're wondering if we just sort of made them up where they were, but it's all been peer reviewed. And uh, again, you can find these out on the USGS Publications Warehouse. All right, so getting back to our city, we went, we wanted to go and we did go block by block, starting down here. We took some, in fact, actually the first two trees we cored were along the Alabama River. We did a bunch along Cypress Creek. We also had some um, acid diffusion bag samplers placed in the bottom of the stream for another study. And then we went, like I said, we went up each city block. And you might notice right away, you know, we got some tree cores that are right near the wells, like I said, but there's others blocks where we have absolutely no well or no tree core. Well, why might that be? Well, in some cases, there were either no trees or there were no uh, city trees or there were trees but weren't big enough or weren't the right type because not every species utilizes groundwater. Or uh, we had areas where there were trees, but they were on private property and we could not get permission quick enough to sample them, so we left them alone. Um, so yeah, there were a lot of areas where we couldn't get um, trees for those reasons, which was disappointing because in some cases there were no wells. Other cases we had trees where there were no wells, so we were able to increase the site characterization. And then the farther we got uphill, the more trees, we were able to sample, which in a way was good because that's where the water table um, was the deepest. All right, so here are the results. Again, we had a hotel, I think we were somewhere down, down here. All the samples and the tree cores are being run on the GC. And here's what the results look like. So anything that's got a color in it means a detection. So, you know, down here we have some at the river, some along the creek. You know, there's multiple sources. Not all of these contaminants can be traced directly back up to this area. Um, there were some blocks where we had trees that had trichloroethylene, that's the yellow, but they had some nearby neighbors that were, we couldn't find anything. And the farther we went uphill, it looked like we had a zone that sort of corroborated what was being shown by the, the groundwater data that this was sort of where the source might have been or a source. Then we started to go up farther uphill and we went to this tree right here in particular and it had the highest concentration of TCE that any of us on the team had ever measured. 
That was 68,000 parts per billion by volume. Remember, we're measuring it by volume in that tree core headspace collector. So the question was, you know, we're way uphill. There were really no, at the time, known potential sources. So why was there um, such a high volume? I'm going to go back, you know, right here is what we're talking about. Remember, this whole area had sort of a zone of potential contamination, but this, at the time, was considered the predominant source. So the question is, why would we find not only the detection of anything up there, but why is it so high? And there's, I took this picture here to show this, this, this is a, a grate that leads to the combined sewer. And, uh, you know, at the time there was a combined sewer and sanitary uh, system and with stormwater, I'm not sure if that's how it is now, but this is important for the next uh, slide. Essentially, if you plot our tree core hits with, this is just whatever in the groundwater um, sampling, this is the, the plume or shadow of, of contaminated groundwater that is, you know, in this case, perchloroethylene or PC greater than 100 micrograms per liter. So that doesn't mean it's the only place it's contaminated. In fact, the contamination in groundwater extends out broader, but this is just showing what it looks like for the 100 microgram per liter, uh, per liter contour. But like I said, we would have expected the highest concentrations to be detected in tree cores down here. So why was it, you know, up here, uphill, of what we thought was the source, et cetera. So let's, again, groundwater's flowing this way. So there's our tree, tree 64, that I showed you. And back here, there turned out this nice building used to be a printing press. And printing presses used uh, from the 1960s and maybe a little bit earlier used chlorinated solvents to, to wash the printing blankets, et cetera. So it was another potential source of what was in the groundwater. Um, but that and other potential sources only operated during certain times. In fact, that printing press was not a printing press uh, when we were there. It had been switched to office buildings. So the other thing we could figure out using not just the tree cores, things that you've taken before, but tree cores to get the contaminant amount and distribution, but what about the timing? And this is, again, something that you guys have probably looked at in terms of dendrochronology. Because if we found the detection, the question then became, well, how long had that tree been exposed to that? And if we could figure out in the ring structure where it was exposed, maybe you could tell us about the timing of the release. So we took more cores and shaved them down and were able to identify the rings. And I'll show you how we analyze them. But first, um, like here, in fact, is one set of tree cores that we took. Again, we did this in, in uh, during the calendar year 2008. So here would be the most recent, you know, after we, we removed the bark, the rings would go back in time. And this is just generic. I'm not really counting the rings specifically here, but the idea you, as you know, is you get back further towards the, the center and heartwood, you get, um, you know, older and older time. This is, I did, I had to show this because I show this to other people and like, oh, big deal. I figured you guys would be appreciative of this. This is my favorite tree core I ever took. It was in Congaree, um, or no, it was in the Sand Hills uh, National um, uh, Refuge where I went and cored a longleaf pine. I got from all the way from the bark all the way to the center. I've never been this lucky. Maybe you guys do this all the time. But I just wanted to show off. Um, a little diversion. So the question then becomes, if you're looking at tree cores, it's not just a way to age date the tree, but the age date releases. Do you have preservation of contaminants? Because you might be saying, well, didn't Jim say earlier on that, you know, some contaminants are taken up and just disappear? Either they're volatilized or they're degraded. Well, how could that be useful? Uh, we know it works with inorganics. And that's why that slide I showed we talked about hyperaccumulation, that you know, inorganics, the metals go in and they stay put. Organics typically, like the benzenes, et cetera, they're going to be degraded, okay? And I'll show you some pictures here in a bit. MTBE, ethanol, things like that, they're going to be volatilized. But guess what? Perchloroethylene and trichloroethylene have both a metal or 
you know, a, an inorganic, a salt. They have chlorine, but they also have the organic part. So the organic part, the ethenes go away, but it leaves behind this fossil of the chlorine atom. Now, there are some things like potassium and iron that get translocated. They picked up in like a recent ring, but then get pushed to the to the heartward. So there, you have to be a little bit worried about that. But with chlorine, we know it doesn't really transport. So we took our tree rings, we cut up each individual ring and sent it to the lab. And there they did a PIXI analysis. It's a particle-induced X-ray emission. And all these elements from the periodic table that are in yellow, including chlorine, can be seen by this uh, technique. So if you can collect the tree core and if you can deduce and separate individual rings, you can actually use this. This is a commercial type lab. You can send it off and they pelletalize it and they give you the number back per tree. I mean, iron studies, potassium, you know, nutrients. If you have a, you know, a situation with, um, uh, you know, bromine release, uh, this, you know, any, any of these metals can be, you know, so it's just something to think about and to put in, put into your, you know, lead, like you have a, a leaded source where maybe there's high lead in the soil, you know, is it lead exhaust from the pre-1970s or is it something more recent? It's a very powerful tool. So what we did a year later, after we knew the distribution of contamination in the trees, we went back and we started, like I said, we started to pick out some former potential sources, including the known, previously known ones downhill. And we were able to figure out when some of these sources, potential sources had operated. We decided, you know, here's our tree 64. Here's the one that had the very high TCE. We decided, with our budget limits constraints, just to do two. Uh, we well, we actually did all these tree cores, but these are the two that I'm going to show you: tree 23 and tree 47. And keep in mind that tree 23 is farther down gradient, and tree 47 is closer to potential sources. So if groundwater is flowing this way, if there is a release up here, this tree would see it first. And then this tree would see it second, and it would finally daylight down here. So let's, now that we know that context, let's look at, you know, here, here's tree 47. So our down gradient is groundwater flow from these potential sources that operated for very specific times mm -hmm. from the 1940s to the 1990s. So here's tree 47, and then here's time. Now, we were able to get the tree cores for these, plus the trees have to be at least as old as um, the potential time frame you're looking at. I mean, a smaller tree was not growing, say, or a younger tree would not have been growing even when any of these were in operation. So sometimes you might get non detects, but it might be because the tree just simply wasn't around at that time to survey what you're looking into retrospectively. But these trees here, indeed were old enough and big enough to have been around when these particular, um, either when they were in full operation or you know directly they were growing after perhaps there had been some history of releases. And with these compounds, PCE and TCE, that are producing the chlorine that we're looking for in the rings, they weren't really widely used until the 50s and 60s. So we really didn't have to go back much farther than that. But the take home message from here is these two trees are showing that around the time that we have activities up here, up gradient of where groundwater would have moved water past these tree roots, we see a peak in chloride concentration. So we see an accumulation. Again, these are different tree rings. So for this particular year, around the late 1960s, we see the highest peak. And then the tree rings that are getting younger have less and less chloride. Now, down gradient, not only do we have more time, but we also have other sources. We can see the same sort of thing with the peak. It's a little bit delayed because if there was a slug of contamination, it would hit this one earlier and then this one second. But we also have potential other sources contributing. So the chlorine or chloride concentrations is higher by almost two. So a very interesting way 
to take a look at tree rings and actually not just telling us the age of the tree, but if we know what's in each ring and it's not translocated, it can give us the timing of a release. All right, so going back to our urban tree, this is my, my favorite picture, is we know now that you know trees are great, provide shade, provide value, provide all the sequestration and oxygenation, but now you know they can also be used to detect contamination, it can help with the timing of a release and what about remediation? So I've got about um, 10 or so picture slides to show you before we wrap up and then I'll uh, explain um, some options that you can use to learn more about this last particular uh, aspect of remediation. Because you might be thinking again, if these trees are taking up contamination and they're doing it over multiple decades, if the source of the contamination has been cut off, shouldn't over time, as long as the trees are good and there's enough of them, shouldn't they be able to clean and remediate that contaminated aquifer? And the short answer, it, it, it depends uh, and it's site specific, but it, it can be done. And this goes back to what I showed you earlier. We have all these different mechanisms. Um, in fact, the one thing now I'm gonna show you is more of a schematic is, if you have the TCEs and the chlorinated cult solvents, again, the, the organic backbone with the chlorine uh, substitutions, if you have TCE in an aquifer and it's sitting there, the roots in the capillary zone can interact with that dissolved phase TCE and translocate it from the roots to the shoots. Same thing with the gaseous form. You have vapors coming off of this plume, TCE can also go into the, the from the shoots to the roots. It can come out through the uh, through the uh, lenticels from the bark and basically degas that way. If there's a high enough concentration in the subsurface, but typically what's happened is TCE and things like PCE get taken up, translocated, and then through phase one and phase um, two reaction can actually be oxidized in the tree tissue. So what was picked up as TCE now becomes an acetic acid, okay? It's not, now it's not regulated. Uh, so that's a true remediation. Gasoline compounds like BTEC, same thing. Trees can take up BTEX both in its dissolved and gaseous phase. They can emit them as a gas out to leaves in a bark, but they also can oxidize them directly to CO2 in the tissues. Um, we now use ethanol in the old days after leaded gas up until the mid 2000s, we had MTBE, methyl butyl ether, very soluble in water, big water problem, very volatile. Some cases, MTB can enter the roots, go through the shoots, and come out 100% unaffected as a gas. In other cases, if it's slow enough or low enough concentrations, again, it's oxidized to CO2 in tissue. Creosote compounds, as you might find at an old MGP plant or wood treating facility, Naphthalene is one of the more soluble of the PAHs that are found usually in soils and groundwater. Gasoline, or excuse me, the gas phase and dissolved phase can be taken up, translocated, and typically you never find them volatilized. They're always uh, mineralized through phase one reactions, the CO2. All right, so remember Here's Alabama River, here's the Cypress. We are focusing up here predominantly. These are all our tree core locations. These are the monitoring wells. I showed you this sort of wishbone. That was the, you know, um, 100, or between 10 and 100 microgram per liter for PCE. The fact that trees are working up here is important because it, again, gave us the idea of a wider plume distribution, potential sources. But because this, these sources had been operating for so long, and because the groundwater flow direction was down gradient to this creek, the highest level of contamination had accumulated in these lower lying areas. Plus, like I said, you had these wells that are no longer pumping, but for a while they were. So they helped increase the, the flow down, downhill, essentially. So this is really the area um, that you would want to form the focus of any sort of remediation effort using trees. In fact, this block is what, what Neil was referring to earlier. And indeed the city 
and I think some of the urban forester folks took a parking lot where there were very few trees and regraded it. It's just showing a time series. They they regraded it, um, addressed you know any sort of overland flow with these sort of like a bioswale approach. And this is just, just two years after the planting was done. We did not have uh, a direct um, involvement in, in this planting, but we watched it evolve. And it was something that was very, you know, at the time we, we did have a little bit of um, involvement because we can see here that there was this, you know, beautification environmental improvement sign with our name and EPAs and you know, it looked quite nice. And I'll show you a picture here, a more recent picture. And just, you know, right before COVID hit, very, very beautiful stand of trees, uh, ready for sampling, ready for, you know, active remediation was going on. But at the time, there was the inability to collect samples to document this, this free tree remediation. And here's an overview of what essentially this parking lot became which not only was a great place to park your car, uh, but was a potential fight remediation site. Well, we went there and this is an EPA fellow. Um, it's not a homeless guy, <laughs> um, but we went there in November of 2020 to check it out as a potential candidate for some, some future work. And this is what we found. Uh, it had been sort of, you know, some storms that had come through and it was, you know, trees were lying on the ground and it was overgrown. And, you know, a lot of times this happens at most sites that are out in the middle of nowhere where it's hard to get to. But in this case, it was right there, um, you know, in town. I think the, the fact that the storm had come through and there was other potential uses for the land probably led to it being uh, neglected. Um, the, that pretty sign sort of, had some more fading on it over the years. Here's the trees in the background. I mean, they were, you know, planted in 2010. So 10 years later, these were, you know, 60 feet tall. That's that's for sure they were interacting with the groundwater, particularly where the groundwater here was less than 15 feet um, to water. And I just found out a couple of weeks ago that now all the trees have been cut down and it's being, you know, used for something else. Um, so I can't report a story about that. I can just say that, you know, you don't have to plant a fight remediation stand that's huge out in the middle of nowhere. You can, as urban foresters, use trees to uh, not only beautify, but also to detect and to remediate. In fact, what I, I don't want to leave you without first sh sharing you this. Uh, this is not. This is a plug. It's not a shameless plug because we, the USGS and myself, we don't get any funding from this. It's published entirely by Springer, so we don't get any 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 uh, uh, royalties. But this book here is, I think, the only case, the only book that I know that's available that has uh, you know essentially all these things linked into uh, in one in one place. You can go online. You can download chapters, etc. But it talks about historical foundation, the hydraulic control, but what I wanted to point you to, the contaminant remediation. A lot of the figures I showed are from this book. There's multiple uh, case studies of remediation. I wanted to just limit it to the Alabama site, uh, so I didn't have to get into too many distinct details. But this is a place where you can go um, if you're more interested in, and just, you know, just look around. I think there's even a a place where it's, yeah, you can do a free preview. And I think that is the last slide, yes. Okay, I am ready for questions. Thank you. That was very interesting. <clears throat> um, reminder to everyone, if you have questions, um, put them in the chat. I'm gonna read the couple that we do have, but we've still got Plenty of time for questions. Um, are there any drawbacks to using native trees rather than commonly used hybrid poplars? That's a great question. We typically suggest using hybrid poplars because they're sterile and they don't produce a threat to creating an invasive species because they can't reproduce. Um, 
and because they were specifically developed by the paper pulp industry to grow big and fast and quick. And the fact that they use some of the highest uh, rates of transpiration helps us meet the needs of you know, hydrologic control and contaminant remediation. Now there's other plants out there. You know, Neil mentioned, you know, river birch, um, the Tula Nigra, things like that, that, you know, they grow along floodplains. They like to keep their roots wet, you know, some loblolly pines, et cetera. Uh, you can use those. In fact, we suggest um, the inclusion of those. We just recently finished uh, planting a Superfund site in Columbus, Mississippi, we did 2,000 trees of two different types of poplars, and we interspersed in the poplars things like willow, uh, you know, sandbark willow, coyote willow. We interspersed some eucalyptus. Uh, the EPA wanted to intersperse a couple other trees. I mean, they were looking at pecans and peaches. Um, so yeah, the idea is your first thing is to, to choose these, these uh, hybrids because they're cheap. We know they grow quickly. But any farmer, any silviculture specialist knows you don't want to plant a monoculture. So that's when you would augment an infill with more native um, plants. Gotcha. Okay, thank you. Um, <clears throat> next question. Are there public health dangers in utilizing phyto trees for things like wood products, fruits, or nuts? That's a great question. The I'll answer the first one last. Um, and I just mentioned we had, you know, the EPA had wanted to try pecans and peaches because at this last site we just planted um, in Columbus, Mississippi, their rationale, and I think it's it's supported by the literature, is that many cases, and I tried to show them in the talk, what we're looking at with contamination, it's in the transpiration stream. So it's in the xylem. So it's not going to get into, it's not going to become part of the fruit water. It's not going to become part of the nut water. Um, there have been studies where, for instance, in herbaceous plants or carrots and, and leafy vegetables, that, yeah, you may not want to plant those, but for hard tissue, hardwood type, softwood plants, um, we have not seen much evidence that fruits will accumulate or nuts will accumulate any of the groundwater component. Now, the, what was the other? What was the first part of that question, other than the fruits? Uh, wood products. You know, I actually thought you could grow treated lumber by feeding trees heavy metals, <laughs> uh, but you know now, um, because they you know they used to do the the, the carpo, copper arsenicals, uh, they impregnate the the cut wood, but I I think. Um, We've not seen any evidence where, particularly for things like TCE and BTEX and ethylene, they're degraded to CO2 in tissue. It's very hard to find it. In fact, that's why we had to only look for chlorine in the tree rings. We weren't going to find, you know, the TCE. And that that's, you might say, well, why wouldn't you find PCE? Well, what we're looking for when we're doing our tree cores, our block by block, is we're looking at the water that day. So it's not like if we shut off the source underneath, we would still see water, but we wouldn't see the PCE anymore. So it's a very ephemeral thing where the chlorine left behind from the previous uptake of PCE or metals would be left behind. But I've not seen anywhere in the literature where levels have accumulated so high in living trees where somebody who would want to use that tree, you know, for a cabinet or something else would be uh, a threat. I mean, if it was if if the concentrations the tree was exposed to were that high, that it would probably be first detrimental to the tree. The mm -hmm. tree would die, and then it wouldn't be used for lumber. Gotcha. Okay, um, that is all the questions in the chat right now. We still have a couple minutes left, and then Neil, if you want to hop back on, um, yeah. I'll put this. Yeah. Slide thank you, Lisa. Up. Okay. All right. Thank you, Lisa. Uh, Jim, I, this is a minor uh, follow-up to uh, the Montgomery experiment. Uh, that was news to me that the trees have been removed, but there was a city 
manager, an urban planner in the city of Montgomery that approached us after your study and your report. And he's the one that came to the Alabama Forestry Commission with the idea of planting those hybrid poplars. Mm -hmm. It really in intrigued us uh, that the city uh, urban planner would think like that. Unfortunately, he passed away about a year later and we really lost that support of the city for this project. And I think it kind of succumbed to the economic, uh, anyway, long story short, uh, that was a lesson for me that when you plan a fire remediation project in a high profile location like this, you really need to have buy-in from a lot of people with uh, uh, the public health uh, aspect, uh, representatives, the economic folks, and it really needs to be a team project and uh, not just, um, you know, a state forestry agency like us. Uh, so um, I'm, I'm sorry we didn't carry the ball very well after your report <laughs> on that FIDO project, but I think that's an important lesson for all of us is that there has to be a long-term management plan constantly uh, managing the effectiveness of these projects and making sure that there's buy-in from the city and all the uh, vested interest uh, in a downtown area. Um, but uh, I think this was an outstanding presentation, Jim. I I'd like to give a plug for your book. I hope folks will look that up. I have a copy of it in my hand right now and I've referred to it many times the past number of years and, and uh, your presentation is really uh, added to my interest in this topic. Uh, I think uh, if, if folks want to follow up with you, I know we have some folks representing water quality and, and nonprofits and uh, municipal water services on the, on the webinar. Is there a way they can reach you? Yes, and thank, uh, again, thanks for your leadership. Thanks for the invitation. Um, I'm honored that you have a copy um, of my book. It, it makes me feel um, you know, if I can at least provide one other person something that they might get um, beyond their own experience, then it's, it's worth it. Uh, yeah, but you can reach out to me at my email is the best. It's uh, J-L-A-N-D-M-E-Y at USGS.gov. So it's J-Landmay at USGS.gov. Good. Thank you. Uh, well, okay. Well, with that, uh, uh, Elisa, we don't have it. If we do, we have any other questions before we uh, talk about next month's speaker? Whoops. Uh, no, no other questions in the chat. Okay. Uh, all right. Uh, one just popped up. Uh, I think it has to do with our archive uh, webinars. Do you see that, Elisa? Can you respond to that question? Yes, sorry, I'm <laughs> having technical difficulties. <laughs> uh, yes, I will respond to that. And for anyone else wondering, um, this will be uploaded to our website um, probably later this afternoon, if not uh, sometime tomorrow at the latest. And I will put that link in the chat here. Okay, super. Yeah, I just realized I could type into, I put my email there. Great, great. All right, uh, super. Uh, okay, Elisa, if you could pop up our uh, next slide uh, on our next speaker for everyone to see. All right, oh, there you go. There we go. Uh, we're gonna switch gears a little bit next week on a topic I think of interest to many people here and that's invasive <laughs> plants in our communities, big issue. Uh, we're gonna have Bill Bullock. Uh, he's listed as a volunteer, but he's a very knowledgeable person and spearheaded a a very successful eradication project in Overton Park, which is in Memphis, Tennessee. And I don't think you want to miss this presentation. It's going to be very practical and um, perhaps can prepare you for your own eradication efforts uh, next year. So that will be on August 18, uh, same time, same place. Uh, once again, we qualifies for an ISACEU and we hope to see you at that one. And Jim, I just want to thank you again. Uh, outstanding job. And you've, uh, I think you've impacted a lot of people today. Yeah, thanks again, everybody. Sorry I couldn't see you. Um, I'll figure out my camera maybe the next time. <laughs> I'll be able to 
look you guys in the eye and hopefully see everybody else too. All right. Thanks. Thank Not you. Everybody.